This morning as we continue with our study in the book of Acts, we come to one of the most important and interesting and even divisive chapters in the entire Bible. The second chapter of Acts. Acts 2 describes the coming of the Holy Spirit in fullness and in power into the lives of all those who had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now this important event happened at Pentecost, which is very significant. You say, well, what in the world is Pentecost? Well, Pentecost was a Jewish religious festival. It was basically a festival of thanksgiving. Another name for, the, for Pentecost is the Festival of Weeks. If you hear someone say the Festival of Weeks, that's the same festival as the Festival of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th because the feast that celebrated the end of the grain harvest came 50 days after celebration of first fruits that marked the beginning of the grain harvest. So Pentecost was a time of thanksgiving. It was a time of thanksgiving for the harvest, but it also was a time of thanksgiving, as we'll talk about in a little bit, for the giving of the law, because they also were being thankful at the same time for that. So you say, well, that's all very interesting Old Testament history, but why is that significant to us? Well, it's significant because the Jewish feasts parallel the ministry of Jesus Christ. If you are a student of the Bible, as many of you are, and you've done a lot of more basic studies in the Bible, let me give you a good advanced study for you to undertake. How did the life and ministry of Jesus parallel the Jewish holy days and feast of the Old Testament? How did Jesus fulfill the Old Covenant? Now let me give you just a preview of a little of what you'll find if you do that. Begin with the Passover. Some of you have probably seen a presentation that's often called Christ in the Passover. How the Passover ceremony that the Jews have practiced since ancient times is perfectly reflected in the life and the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Now I can't go into all the different, you know, details of how that's true in the Passover itself, But let me use a broad brush and just say as the Jews were celebrating Passover, the celebration of God's deliverance of them from Egypt by the slaying of a Passover lamb and placing its blood on the doorpost of their homes so the angel of death would pass over their house as God executed the last plague on the Egyptians opening the promised land to the Jews. Jesus, the ultimate Lamb of God, was slain for the sins of the world on the cross and His blood was poured out to cover our sins to save us from the second death, eternal death, and opens heaven and eternal life, the ultimate promised land for us. Next, if you go to the first fruits, the beginning of the festival of weeks, the festival of Passover, and what you will notice uh, very quickly in your study is it occurred the first day of the week following Passover. That means as the first fruits of the barley harvest were being offered in thanksgiving to God in the temple, Jesus Christ was, as 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep. Pentecost, as I told you earlier, actually celebrated two events in Jewish life. First, it celebrated the end of the grain harvest. And before the day of Pentecost was over, Acts 2 tells us a great harvest of about 3,000 souls who had confessed Jesus as the Messiah and Lord was completed. But I think even more significantly, Pentecost was also the Jewish celebration of the giving of God's law, the law of Moses. When the children of Israel left Egypt after the Passover and began their journey into the wilderness, God led them to Mount Sinai. Seven weeks later, He gave them a set of laws to live by. At Pentecost, the Jews celebrated the giving of the law. For them, the law wasn't a grievous thing. It was the very mind of God, the thoughts of God that God had shared with them. And they were thankful. So at Pentecost, the Jews were celebrating the giving of the law, but Christians today celebrate Pentecost because of the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. You see, Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He was the ultimate Passover lamb. He was the first fruits of the resurrection. And He fulfilled the law, not only by perfectly keeping the law, but also by sending His Holy Spirit to fill His followers so that they could be empowered to live the life God wants us to live, something the law required, 
but didn't empower. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. That's what happened at Pentecost. Individual Christians received the power from God to do what God commanded them to do and now to do what Christ commanded them to do. The early church had none of the things that we think of as essential for success. Beautiful buildings and strategic locations, money, political influence, social status. And yet the early church won tens of thousands to Christ and saw many churches established throughout the pagan Roman world. How was that possible? Because the church had the power of the Holy Spirit energizing its ministry. Acts 2 helps us understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our churches today. So exactly what does this second chapter of Acts teach us? Well, first, verses 1 through 13 describe the church on the day of Pentecost. The events of that first Christian Pentecost are very straightforward. At Pentecost, there were a small group of faithful believers. There were only about 120, we're told, in the book of Acts at the beginning. They were all present in one place. They were praying and suddenly they heard something that sounded like a mighty rushing wind and they saw something that looked like flames of fire. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages that were understood by the Jews who were present from all over the world who had gathered for the Passover celebration that would many, for many who were wealthy enough would extend into Pentecost. Now what are we to make of all this? Well, as you study the events of Pentecost, it's important you separate the incidental, the one-time events, from the essential, the permanent lessons. The first Pentecost was unique. It was unique in the same way that the birth of Jesus was unique. When Jesus was born, there were angels to announce His birth. There were shepherds who went to the manger to see the newborn king. And there were wise men who followed a star to worship the king of kings. Now we don't expect God to recreate those same circumstances and events when Christ is born into our lives. In the same way, I don't believe it's valid to expect God to recreate, recreate the sound of a mighty wind or tongues of fire or enable you to speak in languages you never learned when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. When the 3,000 were converted at the end of this chapter, there's no indication they heard the wind, they saw fire, they had the apostles' hands laid on them or spoken languages they'd never learned. Peter promised them that if they repented of their sins and publicly acknowledged their faith in Christ by being baptized, then the gift they would receive would be the forgiveness of their sins and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift, not tongues of fire, not a mighty rushing wind or speaking in languages that you've never learned. And notice that for these 3,000 new believers, the Holy Spirit came when they believed, when they accepted Jesus as their Savior. The giving of the Holy Spirit to all who believe when they believe is the essential truth. While the sound of the mighty rushing wind, the tongues of fire, the speaking in languages never learned are the incidentals specific to the circumstances of the initial coming of the Holy Spirit into the lives of the early followers of Jesus Christ. Now does that mean I don't believe in glossolalia or what many is more commonly known today as speaking in tongues? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means I don't think that Acts 2 is talking about glossolalia, glossolalia at all. Glossolalia is an ecstatic utterance. It's a praise to God that you, you don't understand them yourself. It's discussed in 1 Corinthians 14 as one possible gift of many gifts the Holy Spirit can give. Here in Acts 2, the Spirit-filled believers are speaking in known languages, not in unknown tongues. Luke names 15 different geographical locations and clearly states that the, the citizens of those places heard Peter and others declare God's wonderful works in their own national languages. The Greek word translated language in verse 6 and tongue or language in verse 8 is dialectos and refers to a language or a dialect of some specific country or di district. On the first Pentecost, God gave roughly 120 believers the ability to speak and be understood by people from many different lands. We don't ever see that happening again in the Bible. So why did God do it at Pentecost? Well, because Pentecost was a reversal of God's judgment at the Tower of Babel. When God confused the human language to prevent people from working together to do evil, now God would unite believers in the Spirit 
so that they could communicate with each other and join together to do that which is good and pleasing to God as they share the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. It was important that the believers could speak in many languages and, be un and understand each other on the day of Pentecost. It symbolized the unity God wanted to give His church and that we would all ultimately be one people. It was also important that they heard the mighty sound of the rushing wind on that first Pentecost. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is referred to Ruach, the wind. The, 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 the Spirit of God is described that way, and Jesus tells His disciples in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit was like the wind that blows wherever it pleases. So the sound of the wind would indicate to these Jews who knew the Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus that this was the Holy Spirit. The tongues of fire reminded those present of the presence of God. God had spoken to Moses from the burning bush. When the Jews were, during the Exodus period, you know, they were led by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire in the evening. The fire on the altar in the temple symbolized the consuming righteousness of God. John the Baptist had proclaimed that he, not on, he only baptized with water, but the one who followed him would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The sound of the wind, the tongues of fire, and the ability to speak in many languages symbolize the powerful presence of God and the powerful witness of Christ that Christ's church would have. These were important symbols for the first Pentecost. But they're like the star of Bethlehem and the angels filling the heavens, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and the shepherds and the wise men. They were for a specific time and a specific place, signs announcing something new, something very important. What verse 38 and 39 make clear, however, is that the gift of the Holy Spirit is for all times, for all places, for all true believers. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then God has given you the gift of the Holy Spirit according to the New Testament. What now should that mean in your life? Well, verses 14 through 41 show us the effects the Holy Spirit uh, caused in the life of the first church, the first Christians. First, we're shown the church witnessing to the lost by the power of the Holy Spirit. As soon as the Spirit came upon the believers, they began immediately to witness to everyone around them about the power of God and the plan of God to save those who would repent from their sins and accept what God had done through His Son, Jesus Christ. They were filled with the Spirit, witnessing with such joy and such exuberance that some of the spectators thought they must be drunk. That led Peter to stand up and explain what had happened. <clears throat> Peter explained the phenomena of Pentecost as the fulfillment of God's promise through the prophet Joel. This is verses 17 through 21. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter says to them, what you're seeing happen is what God's prophets told us would happen. You're, you're seeing the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which prepares us for that future day, the day of the Lord, when He'll bring time to an end and we'll all stand before Him for judgment. Peter then proclaims that you can prepare for this day of the Lord by accepting Jesus Christ as God's promised Messiah. And Peter supports that claim by presenting three lines of evidence. <clears throat> First, Peter says the miracles God performed through Jesus attested to His Messiahship. In verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. Peter's audience knew about Jesus. They knew he was a real man who had lived. And most of them had at least heard about Jesus and the many miracles he had performed. Not even the Jewish leaders denied that he did miracles. They just said he did them by the power of Satan. It was clear, Peter points out, that God's hand was upon Jesus in a very real way through the miracles that He did while He was there upon the earth. Second, Jesus' resurrection attests to His Messiahship in verses 23 through 32. Verse 23 describes the crucifixion, 
from the vantage point of both God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge and human responsibility. How can God be absolutely sovereign and completely in control and yet at the same time human beings' choices make a difference, they're important, and we're held responsible for our actions? Verse 23 says, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. That tells us God knew in advance and he planned the cross. But wicked men put Jesus to death and are responsible for what they did. No efforts made to reconcile the two concepts or to reduce the inevitable tension between them. God is sovereign and in complete control, but we choose whether we're going to do good or evil and we're held accountable for our actions. But the story doesn't end on a hill outside the ancient city walls of Jerusalem, Peter says. Death didn't have the last word. Peter goes on to say in verse 24, For God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And ever since that miraculous resurrection, Peter will go on and say, Jesus has ruled and reigned in heaven and been with his followers here on earth through the Holy Spirit until the time God puts his enemies under his feet and he rules and he reigns uh, forever and ever. Then in verses 25 through 28, Peter appeals to his Bible, our Old Testament, to support his claim regarding Jesus' resurrection. In verse 25 through 28, they're from the Septuagint version of Psalm 16, 8 through 11. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also rests in hope. Verse 27, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter argues that God's promise was never to David who did die. This passage had its ultimate fulfillment, Peter says, in Jesus' resurrection. The third evidence of Jesus' Messiahship in Peter's message at Pentecost was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In verse 33 through 36 we read, Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. You see, Peter asserts God not only had raised Jesus from the dead, but He also had exalted Him to a position of power at His right hand and having received the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus had poured out His Holy Spirit on His followers at Pentecost, something the crowd was writ witnessing right before their eyes. Again, Peter appeals to Scripture to support his claim. This time he cites Psalm 110.1. He argues that since David had not ascended into heaven, the promise had its fulfillment in Jesus Christ the Messiah. Then Peter closes his message with a bold appeal for people to make a decision and accept Jesus as Messiah and Lord in their lives. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And it says Peter went on to plead with them. Peter's leading a bold evangelistic service. He's calling for people to make an eternal life or an eternal death decision. But it's not a one-man show. Look at verse 32. Peter says, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of that fact. You need to underscore the word all. The primary evidence of the Holy Spirit Spirit's presence and power in all the believers' lives was that they were all out there boldly witnessing about Jesus Christ and the wonderful things He had done, and it was done by all of those who'd received the Holy Spirit. They were talking about Jesus and praising Jesus in the languages they had never learned. But that's not the only, the, the only effect the presence of the Holy Spirit produced in the early church. The chapter closes in verses 42 through 47 by showing us the church living out its spirit-empowered faith in the world. Not only did the church have a verbal witness, the entire way they lived their lives, the entire way they related to one another was a witness to the world of the Holy Spirit's ability to change people's hearts and minds. 
In verses 42 through 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church was unified. It had a powerful testimony to the unsaved, not only because of the miracles done by the apostles, but also because of the way the members of the fellowship loved each other and served the Lord. The Christians you meet in the early chapters of Acts, they weren't content to meet once a week for services as usual. They met daily, even though most of them had jobs. They cared daily for each other, even the poor outside the church. They won souls daily. They searched the scriptures daily. They increased in number daily. Now, how did they do all of that? Well, they didn't. The Spirit did it through them. A.J. Gordon, a pastor, tells the story of going to the World's Fair when he was just a boy. From a distance, he saw a man in a red suit pumping water with one of those old hand pumps. The water was just pouring out, and he said as he looked from a distance, he thought to himself, that man is pumping water faster than anyone I've ever seen in my entire life. But when he got closer, he found out it was a wooden man and he wasn't pumping the water. The water was pumping him. And that was the secret of the early New Testament church we see in the book of Acts. Like the Jews invading the promised land, God went before them. You know, in the Old Testament it will say ten Jews would defeat a hundred of the enemy. How is that possible? Well, it's only possible by the power of God. When we see what these early Christians accomplished, the power of their message, the effect in their lives, we say, man, they were really pumping out the power of God. But when we take a closer look, we discover that it was not these people who were pumping out the power of God. The power of God was pumping them, empowering some amazing results. Now, I don't think what we see happening in the early chapter of Acts is normative. In other words, I don't think that the church was ever intended to meet every day, daily, or for everyone, all Christians, for all time, to have all their property in common. It was a supernatural explosion of God's power celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit and the inauguration of the church. But the principles that we learn in Acts 2 still apply today. Nothing extraordinary will ever happen in our churches or in our lives without the outpouring of the power of God which comes with the presence of the Holy Spirit and with prayer. We do not pump out God's power. He pumps His power into us. So how does that happen today? Well, Jesus said the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He blows where he wills. Last week I asked you the question, how do you catch the wind? Well, you can't. You can't pack it into a box. You can't chase it down and put it on a leash. You can take a large mouth jar and hold it open against the wind and quickly slap the top on, but wind that's contained is no longer wind, it's just air. Air sustains life, but it's powerless to drive a sailboat across the water or lift a soaring eagle to new heights or turn the blades of a windmill. You can't catch or contain the wind. If you try, all you have is air. And that's what most of us have done with the gift of the Holy Spirit that God gives us when we accept Jesus Christ. We've bottled it up. We've confined it in our lives to Sundays and our time as a Bible study. We've decided what we will and will not do for God. We've quenched the Spirit with our control needs and our insecurity and with our sin and selfishness and pride and materialism and self-centeredness. And then we have the audacity to blame God and say, God, why don't you send the Holy Spirit in my life the way I sit in the book of Acts, the way you did in the early church? You cannot catch the wind. You cannot box the Holy Spirit in. If you try, if you set all kinds of limits as to what you were willing to do and what you won't do, and the the Holy Spirit's limited to the role of air that keeps you alive 
instead of wind that empowers your life. But if you'll raise the sails because you're ready to be obedient to God's will wherever it takes you, if you'll unlock the blades of the windmill to power the projects God wants to do in and through you, if you'll spread the wings of your soul to soar to the heights God wants for you, then you can't catch the wind, but the wind can catch you and carry you into life's adventures God's prepared for you. And that can happen at any age. Friends, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you already have the Holy Spirit right now. The only question is, are you going to allow it to be air or wind in your life? After accepting Jesus Christ, this is the most important decision you have to make in your life. That decision will determine not only the direction of your life, but it will have a profound effect on this church, on your family, on where you work, on everyone around you. You cannot catch the wind and you can't take the Spirit and make Him fit into your mold. But you can turn your life over to Him and you can let Him remold and remake you. And if you decide to do that, it's explosive. Things start to happen. And you begin to experience Pentecost in your life. And you're not afraid anymore. And you're not bored anymore. And you're not not controlled by the circumstances around you anymore. You're free. Because God has set you free. Would you join me as we pray? Father, there is so much more that you want to give us. Each one of us. You want to give us more courage. You want to give us more faith. You want to give us more peace. You want to free us from anxiety and worry. Father, you want to use our lives to touch the lives of other people in big ways and in small ways. You want us to see you using us, Father, to make other people's lives better. And when we see you using us as individuals to help other people to make their life better, when we know that you've worked through us, Father, such joy fills our heart. That's what happened on the first Pentecost, Father, as your Holy Spirit came as they shared the wonderful things that you had done in their lives. Such joy filled their hearts and lives. Father, I pray for each and every person in this congregation. I pray, Father, that they would not just turn the Holy Spirit into bottled air, that keep them spiritually alive and takes them across the finish line. But instead, Father, that they would open themselves up to the winds of the Spirit. And that, Father, each of us would stop telling you what we will and will not do, what we can or cannot do, because, Father, when we turn it over to you, you can do things in and through our lives that we never imagined were possible. Father, you tell us if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. We fight for years to be free, Father, of things that hold us down like chains when all we need to do is to walk in the Spirit, to allow your Spirit to have sway and your promise is, then then we won't habitually fulfill the desires of the flesh. That doesn't mean we don't fall down sometime. But it means, Father, you pick us back up as we sail along, Father, on the winds of the Spirit. Father, I pray that we would experience that Pentecostal power. Father, it's not a matter of mighty rushing winds or seeing flames of fire or people speaking in languages that they've never learned or or everyone having the same gift, one gift out of many that's possible that you can give. It's a matter of us opening our lives totally and completely to you. And I pray that we would make that decision in order that we might experience the abundant life that Jesus Christ said that he came to give us and that the Holy Spirit empowers us to have as we entrust our lives to you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.